Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ACEDS webinar channel. My name is Mike Guadararo. I'm president of ACEDS. Before we get started today, please know that we are always happy to take your questions, and they can be submitted in the Q&A widget located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, all questions are anonymous. Also, if you'd like a copy of the slide deck from today's presentation, it can be downloaded from the resource widget also at the bottom of your screen. Okay, without further delay, I am pleased and super excited to introduce the webinar today, Faster, Better, Smarter, Enhancing Document Review Workflows, Privilege 2, with H5 Matter Analytics email threading. Brought to us by our fantastic partner, H5. I am pleased to introduce a great lineup of speakers today. We've got Jason Richards, the VP of Product at H5. And joining us also is Joe Murrell, founder and CEO of Practice Aligned Resources. And I will now hand off to Jason to get us started. Jason, take it away. All right, thanks, Mike. And a big thank you to everyone joining us today. I'm Jason Richard, VP of Products for H5, and I look forward to spending the next hour with you. For those of you who aren't familiar with H5, we specialize in providing search and data analytics solutions to companies and law firms to help them find key facts and insights in the context of e-discovery, investigations, litigation, and other data management challenges. Uh, we're joined today uh, by Joy Morrell, CEO and founder of Practice Aligned Resources, who will be contributing her extensive experience and insights to our discussion. And we'll be starting the discussion with a look at some of the challenges with email content review, explain what email threading really is and why the right technology, plus thoughtful and efficient review workflows that incorporate email threading are so important for your email data. We'll provide a live demo of H5 Matter Analytics, our proprietary technology focused on accelerating email content review while mitigating risks by revealing critical insights. And we'll hear from Joy with real-world examples of how organizations are using email threading to both significantly reduce costs and improve consistency, as well as common pitfalls to look out for, including her suggested best practices on incorporating these capabilities into your review workflows. And finally, we'll finish with questions and answers. Before we start, Joy, would you like to share some background information about Practice Aligned Resources? Thanks, Jason, and hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so PAR, you know, we've been consulting with both public and private sector legal departments and case teams, and we've been providing uh, consulting services on the e-discovery process end-to-end um, -end and um, industry practices. And what's most uh, notable for being on this call is that we utilize partners, um, innovative partners like H5, to assist these case teams. So really looking forward to discussing how all this technology can help um, your reviews and your privilege logs. Thank you, Jason. All right, thanks, Joy. Now let's discuss some of the challenges with reviewing email uh, in your data population. So first, the data volume. Email spilled today is the largest body of collected documents in the discovery process, comprising up to 80% of all business ESI. Second, conversations can be difficult to follow. Email conversations can be fluid with numerous changes in email participants, branching of conversations, and even changing topics within the same conversation. Next, emails are highly duplicative as they subsume each prior message. Even after you deduplicate a data population, the battle against duplication really isn't over. Each email is aggregating prior messages, so you still have a significant amount of duplicative content to sift through as you work through your email population. Next, understanding who knew what and when. Understanding who's present in an email or email branch and when they're introduced or removed uh, can mean a great deal, whether it's conducting a privilege review, an internal investigation, uh, or determining responsiveness. With complex and branching conversations, they can create, this can create a logic puzzle that is important to solve correctly or there can be big consequences. Finally, fluctuating email and display names. Understanding who's who can be difficult due to changes in the presentation of individuals in email headers. This includes complex strings from different mail systems, varying or absent display names, not to mention differences in personal and work email addresses, nicknames, maiden names, et cetera. The result is that you're left with a large percentage of your review work where it can be difficult to understand who knew what and when to understand the developing narrative. The review has a sea of duplicative content and extra attention needs to be paid to understand all of the context of email conversations to avoid costly mistakes. Joy, how does this align with your experience in supporting your customers? Well, thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, one thing I, I do notice is that, you know, while 
we used to, emails obviously have been collected for a long time. I just feel that now in some of the cases, whether it's public um, or private, that email collection, the volumes are definitely getting higher. There actually isn't the hesitation anymore about collecting um, all the email or collecting email like it used to, um, cell phones, right, everything, text messages. It seems more commonplace to me on a higher percentage of cases that it's just like a no-brainer, yeah, collect this, collect that. So the volume is definitely going up. But what I'm also noticing is the case teams on some of our public clients and also smaller law firms, the case teams to do document review aren't growing. And you're seeing some of these projects not being allowed or not having the budget to go to uh, third parties for document review um, support. So the case teams, unfortunately, whether it's two to four people, are now having to um, manage a reviewing and getting through this large amount of documents. So I think that's a slight difference than what we used to see in the past. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Julie. And now let's provide a quick intro to H5 Matter Analytics and talk about how H5 solution is helping organizations address these challenges. So H5 Matter Analytics is a solution we developed inspired by a lot of the extensive analytics and technology system review experience uh, that we've been bringing to the industry for the past two decades. We focused on developing very practical solutions with techniques and workflows that we know work and have battle tested over many years of delivering expert services to our customers. H5 Matter Analytics is a fully relativity integrated application. It can be licensed and deployed on premise within your relativity environment or offered as a part of H5 services. Uh, some key strengths of Matter Analytics include our seamless integration inside of your relativity workspaces, advanced email threading and name normalization capabilities, which will be a key focus of our presentation today, direct access to key information about individuals you encounter during the review without having to leave the document you're viewing, uh, a unique and accurate linguistic modeling approach for PII identification, and more. We'll also offer the application at a very cost-effective uh, licensing model or within a very cost-effective licensing model that makes it easy to step into. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about what email threading is. So today, email threading is the most commonly used form of analytics in e-discovery. It's ultimately a process of analyzing collected email messages and assessing their text and message headers to establish relationships amongst collected messages and organize them by conversation, also known as threads. Once done, most email threading processes have an ability to identify which message contains truly unique content, such as attachments, uh, or the last message in a thread, and this helps organize reviews, reduce redundancy, and mitigate the risk of making inconsistent document assessments. So now before we get further into the presentation, we're going to do a quick poll. So the first question is, what frequency do you apply email threading to your matters? Always? Most matters? Sometimes? It depends? Or never? We'll give everybody a few minutes to, or a minute here to respond. what we got here from a results perspective. All right, this is an interesting mix. Always, most matters, and sometimes it depends. Uh, we're almost neck and neck here, uh, but it looks like always and sometimes uh, are evenly matched. That's really interesting information. And we've got one more poll here that we're gonna go to, which is if you're not using email threading today, why not? Is that because review teams are, may have some different levels of comfort with using threading? The cost of running threading, timelines are too short for threading, or not enough data to warrant thread. And this is specific maybe to the matters where you're not doing the threading as opposed to the ones where you are. All right, everybody, one more minute. Okay, let's keep moving here. Here's, we have just gotten frozen on our live view. Oh, and we're back.
Deja, did you want to show the um, the, 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 the statistics for the results? No, it looks like the results are giving us a little bit of an error here. Let's see if we can push oh. on to the very yeah. next slide. We're seeing it. We're seeing it now, Jason. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. All right, great. Um, so, so let me... So I'm seeing, Jason, just so you know it while you're doing that, um, I'm seeing 12% the review team's comfort with threading. Uh, and the 36%, which is second highest, is cost of running threading. And the highest is 52%, not enough data to warrant threading. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, and it looks like I've had a little bit of an issue with Chrome here, so I'm just going to dial right back in so we can continue uh, our conversation here. Well, I like the fact that there's zero percent for timeline is too short for threading because it's exactly right. right? We use threading when there isn't enough time, so it's perfect. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think what we're seeing is an increasing adoption on every matter because as folks start to get a handle on the value that it provides them uh, on each of the matters, they get more and more comfortable with how to leverage it. I think we're seeing uh, uh, a lot more uh, adoption. Yeah, and um, the fact that the review team, the comfort level, the comfort being comfortable with threading is the lowest outside of the um, zero time. Um, but of the three, it's the lowest. I think it's three, two, because that means that it, it makes sense, right? And in analytics for me, um, the email threading, whenever we used to ask, well, do you want analytics on your uh, workspace or in your database, um, it would confuse them. They would always jump to, no, no, I don't want predictive coding. And, you know, for a while we started to just ask, well, would you like email threading? And they would say yes, but no to the analytics. And we would just smile, like, okay, no problem. Just so you know, email threading is a part of analytics, so we're going to go ahead and run that. Um, so I think it's kind of great that we've come this far and that they understand the value, like you're saying. Um, one thing I did notice, uh, not enough data to warrant a threading. I know for me, and Jason, let me know when you're all ready and, ready and set up, but um, for me, even if it's a lot of one-way conversations, for example, um, I have a lot of data. Maybe there's not a lot of back-and-forth conversations, so they don't think it's useful um, to to warrant uh, doing email threading because you're not really um, minimizing a lot in the inclusive review. But what I thought recently we've been um, using is the email threading count. So knowing how many are single one-way conversations uh, was a great way to kind of segregate or parse out um, information like things that were coming from the outside coming in um, one way with no response. That was interesting to know and kind of putting that in a different bucket to separate that to a different review or to deprioritize that as a review. When they're really trying to look at what conversations were happening, it was great to have that field available uh, to know that we could actually uh, parse those out and, and kind of bucket those for a later review. Um, so we can really kind of hone in. And also the email threading um, count to look at conversations that were above three or four chains. That was interesting because you can see kind of which ones had 50-plus conversations going on them back and forth was um, uh, really interesting and, and then diving into that. So um, just kind of addressing uh, that not enough data. Um, I'm finding that there are creative ways uh, in your in your tool specifically even um, the other tools that have additional uh, fields of information that are displayed um, besides just the inclusiveness, which we've used to date uh, mostly to help minimize review. That's right. And uh, apologies, it looks like we've got a little bit of an internet discrepancy here uh, on my side, which is causing my, my grief here. Um, but, uh, Joy, if you can advance to the next slide, I can just speak to it. Um, which is how okay. does email threading really work? Okay, it's forwarded. Okay. Uh, so now let's talk about what really happens when you perform email threading. Email threading works by analyzing an email message body and identifying the unique email headers based on details such as the sender and date information. 
It does this both for the top of the messages and throughout the message, creating a structure of the conversation that grows as it identifies later messages related to the same thread. Once it establishes the structure, it can use date and time information to establish a chronological order to the thread and point you to the last message in a conversation or branch. It can also use other information from your review database to understand when attachments are present. Furthermore, it can recognize when text is being lost or changed further down a branch that should be retained for safekeeping. These different scenarios make up instances where unique or the most representative information occurs in a conversation, which is often referred to as the inclusive documents. This is what threading is, is really trying to do, which is identify for you uh, the unique elements to help you reduce the effort and help accelerate your review. Uh, additionally, it can also help identify areas where identical messages exist that have survived the duplication due to slight differences, such as BCC values of one message, but not in the other. These scenarios create duplicate, duplicate spare groups that can enable further content reduction during review. And then, Joy, if you can advance um, through the animation to the threading and name normalization, I'll speak to that as well. Okay. So oh, before sorry. we move on. Did you want me to, sorry, did you want me to go back? I'm so sorry. I went, went too fast. There you go. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's, it's that's, animating now. Okay. And then it should be the threading and name normalization. Uh, apologies. Let's, uh, and I'm back on the internet here, so I'll be back in here in just a second. Okay, there you go, name normalization. All right, so uh, name normalization and threading have become very important to work together. So this is a, a new sort of combination that is uh, very useful uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, and during the threading process, what we're doing is we're spending a lot of time with email headers and getting to know a lot about uh, the senders and recipients, both within a conversation and across conversations. And this presents us with an opportunity. And in terms of um, you know, what that opportunity really gives us, it's that we now can go through uh, and actually uh, detect and understand all of the different communicators that exist in a conversation, both at a top level, but also in the subsumed message headers. Uh, so this is important because a lot of times uh, the people that are most interesting uh, may not be at the top level of the message. They may actually be uh, in a subsumed or derived message, uh, whether it be an attorney or a third party that could have some big implications uh, for uh, different things like priv assessment and so on. And then also, it helps us create a very clean representation by understanding all of the different ways in which people are presented in the data population uh, and not just from a top level sender uh, and the, again, in the recipients and the drive message, but we're looking for all the different variations and then picking the best one uh, to ensure that uh, the names that we use in the presentation are going to be, or sorry, the, the name that we're using to present and represent an individual uh, are the cleanest and best representative of that individual. And so now that I'm in, I can animate it in myself. Here we go. Um, and then once we've identified the best version of a name, we then link all of the other names to the, the best representative. And then we can create a nice variance link of all the different variations, the, the way that someone's represented, along with um, the, the, the display name that we're going to choose as our preferred version. All right. Uh, and now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, matter analytics and how we're working to incorporate a lot of these details. Uh, if you've used email threading, you're still left with a, a bit of a puzzle to solve as you piece together who knew what and when and account for branching and topic changes as well as gaps in collected messages. Uh, and this can be difficult to factor into your thinking. But taking the challenge and turning it a bit on its head, uh, so what we're doing is actually going through and providing some of the same fielded output. So we're, we're not limiting the, the information that we're providing to enable workflows to carry on as they, they do today. Uh, by using just inclusive reasons and duplicate spare information. But we're providing a presentation of the, the documents that is a, uh, a very specific uh, uh, way of, of giving you sort of a super email. So we're kind of taking the concept of inclusive messages and non-inclusive messages uh, and making them making that a little bit less important as you go through and conduct your review. And not only does this help make things easier to understand through this use of this, this sort of super email concept where we're, we're assembling all of the unique content at once, 
and allows you to achieve a huge amount of reduction. Uh, so from our own analysis, we've seen up to 70% reduction in email content that has to be worked through um, through using our H5 Thread Viewer, um, which is uh, you know, a really great advancement from you know, what we see as a typical reduction through thread suppressed reviews of 30 to 40%. So it really takes it to the next level. Uh, additionally, we've enabled uh, a number of insights on top of the viewer, uh, such as identifying changes in participants, allowing quick insights into who people are, uh, as well as being able to make very nuanced and surgical coding decisions or from a branch level or specific message level or combination of messages. Um, so that's a, a quick uh, overview of Matter Analytics. But let's go ahead and hop into the application, given we've lost a few minutes here. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. All right, so now you should be seeing my relativity screen. Okay. So uh, in the demo today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through sort of a, a mock responsive review uh, and also a, a mock privilege review. Uh, and that's going to be centered around a matter, and we'll, we'll go through sort of the cast of characters. But the premise is that we have a uh, promotion discrimination case that we're reviewing documents for. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is hop into Matter Analytics, which is uh, right inside of my Relativity workspace. And this screen of Matter Analytics provides a list of all the different forms of analytics that have been performed for this workspace. Each set represents a specific form of analytics applied to a specific state of search in Relativity with an ability to perform full or incremental builds on each of the individual sets. Uh, in terms of the different flavors of analytics that we're able to run through Matter Analytics, uh, we're able to do things such as email threading and name normalization, which will be really central to our conversation today, near duplicate identification, which is identifying documents that are similar, and then text duplicates, which is identifying documents that have uh, documents where the text is identical, but maybe due to the, the file type or, or white space or other reasons, uh, wasn't able to be uh, hashed the same and uh, removed from a, a deduplication or, or a dupe identification process. Uh, additionally, we have capabilities in here for PII identification, uh, as well as language detection. Uh, but for today, we're going to be focused in on our, uh, our email threading and name normalization capabilities. So I'm going to click on our set here and take a look at some of the reporting that we provide uh, and how this is helpful in informing some of your review workflow structuring that you're going to have to do. So the first thing you're greeted with is information on the saved search that was analyzed. So I can see how many documents there were, how many gigabytes there were, uh, how many custodians, the representative time frame of what was analyzed, as well as the file type composition overview. But if I click on my uh, email threading card, this is when a lot more detail is surfaced. So at the top level, I can see what the top level email reduction was that was achieved through threading. And this is the uh, identification of inclusive and non-inclusive messages. Uh, down below, I can see how that breakdown works when we look at attachments and other elements. I can also see very clearly the different inclusive reasons uh, that have been established within this data population. And I can also see a thread count summary, which helps folks understand uh, the type of groups and the size of the groups that are being established through the threading process. This level of detail is available for all of the different types of analytics that we're providing, whether it's name normalization, your duplicate identification, PII identification, or language identification. Uh, but coming back to threading, another unique thing about our reports is the ability to see when you have rolling data just what's new. And so with a flip of a toggle, I can just look at the incremental information that's been added to the data population. Uh, and this is very important because oftentimes when you're trying to manage a review workflow, you need to know what's new and you need to know what's different or might have changed in the prior data set. So here we introduce some new charts that help you understand uh, what new thread groups have been introduced. Those are entirely new conversations. Documents added to pre-existing thread groups, that's new info about old conversations. And then down here, we can see exactly the items that have changed uh, from the, the prior data set to now. So we can see the documents that may have flipped inclusiveness uh, due to new information being introduced to the matter. And this incremental report is, uh, is representative of what's possible with all of the different types of analytics that we provide. Another important part about reports is how do you share that information? How do you help people understand the value they're going to provide or the information it's going to provide? 
uh, help make informed actions. And so there's a number of ways to do that within Matter Analytics. Uh, we have on each of the different uh, analytics cards an ability to share this page via a link. Uh, you can send that over email or just copy a link to paste in the Skype message. Or you can export the report in HTML uh, or download a PDF. So lots of different ways to help draw uh, folks to this information and be able to then make some very informed actions. And Joy, uh, I just wanted to take a second here to ask you how have these reports helped in your use of Matter Analytics? Yeah, I was actually going to jump in there because um, I think that the dashboards um, have definitely changed the behavior of case teams and their interaction with us as a support team trying to feed them information or data. Um, we've been giving spread, we've been giving um, reports and spreadsheets for years, right? Large, large Excel spreadsheets with just numbers. But some of the decisions, it's, it's amazing on how the dashboard has brought some of those numbers to life for the partner or the, the lead people because all of a sudden they're able to visualize um, the impact that some of this has or what it means. So I've been noticing for us that on one, on one side, it's making the case team a little bit more uh, involved with the direction of how we're going to move forward. For example, you mentioned how the incremental updates with new data, that they actually see the bars and they can suggest, oh, I see blah, blah, added um, X new conversations. Let's just batch that out and give it to so-and-so. Like all of a sudden you see um, case team members actually um, helping to uh, direct us versus, you know, us asking 60 questions every time new data rolls in, which I think gets lost in translation, right? That there's just too much information to communicate and the dashboard really helps to streamline that so us from a technical side can focus on those issues. And then from the practice and content side, I think the dashboard does a great job of explaining and showing. Um, as you see, you can click on different um, those hyperlinks. Uh, that does it really well. Also, what I find for the attorneys who are trying to explain whether it's to the client or to the opposition, how they got to a certain number on what we're reviewing or their methodology on what they are reviewing, they've been able to use these dashboards to explain that. And it's kind of nice because the language on the, the dashboard, it's training them on, on, the, on the terminology that we're using, um, inclusiveness and um, text education, all, or things like that. So I think the dashboards themselves um, just the fact that they're there and the attorneys can either access, access them via the, our integration um, or we could just be sending them links. Or I, even sometimes we just copy and paste um, some of these charts into an email just to kind of grab their attention. And they're like, well, where's that from? Can I see that? So it's been a really great tool for us. And, um, again, you see all the breakdowns. If you go scroll down, uh, Jason, like you were showing, those are really amazing statistics that we, didn't, uh, we weren't able to provide before. So I think this, is, this has been great for us. Excellent. Thank you, Joy. Uh, and uh, you mentioned something that's a good point, that each of these different numbers is actually a link that will open up a document list in Relativity, so it's really easy to get in and look at the documents. And before you even have any fees incurred or you've even committed the results to the workspace, you have an ability to get the same numbers, the same reductions in a preview analysis, uh, where we basically do the analysis and help you understand what production is, we just don't overlay the results and you, until you decide you want them. And so it becomes a really nice way of um, making very informed decisions about costs related to the use of analytics. All right. So now we'll take a look at the reports, but I'm going to click over and take a look at our people profiles here. So the people profiles uh, list here is a list of all of the email communicators that have been identified and extracted from the data population through our threading and name normalization process. Uh, and the information you see here uh, is a mix of things that we're doing in an automated way. Uh, so, for instance, we're automatically identifying a display name that's sort of the best selection uh, of the, the different variants that we find. You're going to be able to see all the email domains that are representative of these individuals. Um, we, the, the Clinton emails here are actually OCR and scanned PDFs with a lot of redactions. So. There's a lot of um, sort of data quality issues, but the system is still able to do a really good job of establishing those relationships uh, and being able to organize this information for you. Um, as I move to the right, though, uh, you can identify folks as being key, either on an individual basis or in bulk. Uh, we can identify folks as being custodian. Uh, you have an ability here to click on these counts and see the aggregate email messages uh, related to that individual, whether they appeared at the top level or in some derived message. So it's really a superset of all communication 
uh, where they were a cast member in. Um, and then you can actually specify what their role is in the case. And so we have the concept of functions, which is really important as a part of our review workflow, which I'll show you in a second, where you can identify folks as being in-house counsel, uh, outside counsel, government agencies, legal agents. So there's a lot of different ways that you can flexibly identify and profile individuals and then have that weave into your, your workflow. Today, we're going to be focused in on our custodians. Uh, so the custodians are going to be the cast of characters that we talk about as a part of um, uh, the narrative that we're going to have in our responsive review. And as I can see here, we've got a handful of custodians. Uh, we've got somebody that's a third party. The other folks are, are uh, employees of the client organization. And we have one person that's not profiled. So looking at her title, she's general counsel. I'm going to go ahead and click on her, her profile, and I'm going to be presented with information about Addy. Uh, up top, we have some standard fields that are, uh, that are provided that allow users to capture things like contact information and title and department. And then there's a lot of custom fields that are available uh, that you can create and manage uh, in different ways that may be helpful in other use cases. Uh, so maybe, for instance, in a data breach use case, you may want to capture that you found uh, different types of personal information related to an individual. So a lot of different ways that these profiles can be used. Down below, we provide a table of all of the different name variations and associations, the time frame uh, that we found those particular variants, and then links to get at exactly those documents. For today's presentation, though, I'm going to go ahead and change her profile such that we mark her as in-house counsel and make sure that she's going to uh, play the right role as a part of the, the demonstration today uh, and be indicated appropriately. Okay. So now we finished up uh, the last profile change on our custodians. Um, and it's very easy, by the way, to do things like a domain filter and mark an entire outside council domain as being outside council from a function perspective uh, through bulk updates. So it's very easy to come in here and really with only a few minutes get a lot of intelligence in here that's going to help uh, support your workflows. So now let's go and take a look at some documents. So now we're taking a look at a set of documents that are in my checked out batch. And so right now I'm focused on a first pass responsive review. Uh, and we can look up here to the view saying my documents to review. Uh, one important thing about uh, just from a best practices standpoint, batching uh, threading information is keeping the thread groups together. Uh, and we can see here we've got a number of documents related to the same thread organized together. I can see here clearly a boundary between this thread and the next thread. Uh, our H5 matter analytics fields are showing us the thread display information, so information about each message. Uh, it's color coded to show inclusive and non inclusive, gives us our inclusive reason. And we can also see the cast of characters that are present uh, in the message, both at a top level as well as a total cast of everybody that's in the email. So subsumed messages, derived messages, uh, and the function of those individuals. And this is really important because if we come down here and look at the, this, this next thread, and I come to this forward, I can see here that uh, this is a derived message. So it's not a message where, um, uh, or sorry, it's a non-inclusive message. Uh, but it's an instance where George is forwarding a message to Albert Stein. And if I look over here, I can see that even though they're the only two top-level communicators, further down in this message, in some message header, we have Addie Lace or in-house counsel. And we also find out that Albert Stein is a third party. So the fields that we're generating and the intelligence that we're putting into your hands allows you to do a lot of creative things from a workflow perspective. Uh, and just off the metadata alone, you can do quite a bit. Uh, but what I'm going to show you next is how we've created uh, an experience inside of the thread viewer uh, or with our H5 thread viewer to really help amplify a lot of this information. So let me click on my first document. Okay. So if we look up top, this is an email message from John uh, to his manager saying that he's very pleased to announce that he's promoting Mike Faraday to the new director of operations role. If I come down here and everything below this bar is the H5 thread viewer or our H5 viewers, uh, I can see that we've got a map that shows us how this conversation unfolds. Uh, we've got color coding for the inclusive messages in the, in the thread. We have uh, stacked messages for our duplicate spares or duplicate messages. We've got derived messages marked in gray. 
And so here I can really understand the contour of the conversation. And over here, I can see that we have uh, a concept of content markers, which are field tags that'll be overlaid with color coding uh, markers on the individual nodes. And then communication markers, which is another form of indicator that we put on the, the thread or on the map view that shows you when certain types of functions are introduced, such as third parties or attorneys. And if I pull this up, and, and you may have seen different thread visualizations in other applications, when I pull this up, I'm going to show you what's really unique about uh, Matter Analytics with regards to how we're presenting the email information. Uh, in the slides, I talked about how we're creating sort of the super email concept. And this is exactly what it is, which is a conversation view. So here, I'm seeing the unique information pulled from each of the different messages that are in the data population. Derived messages are given the same center stage as a, a message that we collected. And we're enabling a lot of feature functionality even on the derived messages. And so if we look at this conversation and how it's unraveling, we can see John is messaging his team. This is the message we just looked at with the HTML viewer. Exact same message, but we pulled it out and given it space and, uh, to start our thread. And then here I see a branch, and this coincides with the branch up here, where George has removed John and Mike and is messaging Marianne saying, where did this come from? I thought for sure Susan was going to get that promotion. And Marianne responds, yes, uh, I'm just as surprised. And so they're, they're apparently not big fans of Mike. If I come down here, Mike is saying thank you for the kind words. Um, and so we may want to find out more information about Mike. And it's very easy. I can click on his name as a part of the message header, and I can see information that's been captured about Mike. He doesn't have a function at this stage so we, because we don't have any color coding. Let me click on his name, and we can go ahead and change that. So we're now on Mike's profile. I'm still on the document, so I haven't left the document and created some confusing back and forth. It's very easy to, to know where you are. I'm going to click Edit. I'm going to modify Mike's function and mark him as the client. And click Save. And now I may want to find out some more information about Mike. It sounds like folks are a little bit displeased with Mike, so I may take a look and see you know, if he'd been forwarding things to his personal email address, uh, or you know, maybe you can even take a look at those messages if they're interesting. But you can also click on our Communications tab and understand the, the group that he keeps with uh, in his communication so that you can see uh, a timeline of his, his different communications in the data population, who his top senders and recipients are, as well as the different organizations that he's communicating with. You can further filter this information by date range. You can find one-to-one -one communications or bulk communications where he's maybe one of many. Or you can even see what other folks is he communicating with from a third-party perspective uh, or the government agency. So it's very easy to come in here and start to filter into the information and understand what communication uh, he has. The other thing that's nice is the blue and the, the uh, gold here, the blue is the number of documents that Mike has been communicating. Uh, or, the, or in the data population related to his communications. The gold is the conversations. This is an ability to actually open up our thread viewer and pop it out and review things a conversation at a time, uh, which makes it very easy to move very quickly and, and understand the narrative around those communications you may have with somebody else. So it's a nice exploration tool, whether it's fact discovery or other work that you're trying to perform. Okay, so we've profiled Mike. I'm gonna go ahead and close Mike's tab and we're going to get back to uh, our thread. Uh, so one thing I'm going to do is just reload this page and just show you that now, anytime somebody encounters Mike as a part of their review, they're going to see that Mike is, uh, is, is a part of the, has been added to the function of client. So you can click on this and get the information here. Okay, so reading this document or this thread, I very quickly find that this is in keeping with what I consider responsive for this particular matter. I can go ahead, if that's the case, and mark all of the different messages in the thread, or I can even handpick specific messages. And you can see down here that it's actually syncing. You have an ability to use your relativity layout to code the documents, or you can use the H5 layout. The benefit of the H5 layout is that we provide some interesting propagation options. So here, I'm going to mark this document as responsive. And I want all of the attachments and duplicate messages to also be coded this way. But if there was a scenario where maybe you wanted to do a more surgical propagation, you can work around and ignore certain items that are doing a mass edit. There's a lot of flexibility in coding documents. So, Joy, uh, I know you found this email review experience valuable in your own practice. We'd love to hear some of the value that you've observed through this presentation of email content with your clients. 
Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, and first of all, I, mean, I think it's amazing how um, intuitive uh, you've built the program and, and how, for example, people have always asked for uh, case map-like features and tools in their document review. And you all kind of look back and you're wondering why, and, and it goes to what you're doing here, which is the people profile. Um, that you'll notice that document review teams always start out right with a packet and um, some background information. And it takes a good two weeks for review teams, large review teams, to get a handle of the characters, the cast of characters, and um, who plays what role when. Like you'll notice that in your people profile, you're also capturing email addresses at different dates and times. So it's kind of interesting to see the progression of a person, um, whether it's jumping jobs or, or different titles. Um, within the organization, so changing maybe their role in that conversation. So what I think is useful, if you notice when you're doing the review and you had the names of all the people that are involved, not just in the top level, but down below, and also um, I think we had talked about there's even a, the future kind where you can see uh, the cast of characters in future conversations in the same thread. I think that's amazing because then the, the actual reviewer can make better calls faster. Right, so that's going to speed up your review. But what I like mostly is it will lessen the over, hopefully lessen the overturns in the second pass, because the first pass reviewers just they're not bad reviewers. They just don't have the right information at that time to make the call. And you'll notice that we kind of leave the more substantive type of calls to the second pass because they know more about the case or the players. Well, now because you have this, what I like about it is a second pass or internal case team or the case team. Uh, can actually share uh, more about the background of these people in your people profiles, which is showing and displaying uh, in this. So uh, for me, it's just increasing the review speed and also increasing the consistency and the accuracy of those calls, which is what we're all looking for. Um, the visualization, seeing how those emails relate. Um, I, what I like about this is that people now can trust and they can see that there were eight Plus, there are a couple of duplicates in, in uh, chain number four. There are a couple of people who had that same chain as a custodian. And you can see the ones that we're reading. We're reading only the inclusiveness, uh, inclusive excuse me, uh, documents. So this whole visualization just kind of goes towards instilling trust and um, seeing the bigger picture. Right? We're always uh, in the trees, so we can kind of step back and see the whole forest in regards to this conversation. Um, so it's, I think it's great. So it's definitely been uh, a game changer in the speed, accuracy, and again, just the more comprehensive thought process towards the document itself. Excellent. All right, thank you, Joy. Um, and now I'm going to continue, and I'll show you some more fun features to help with some of the, the automated indicators of uh, certain types of communicators. Uh, we've marked all of these documents as responsive. I could trudge through the rest of my 12 documents here um, as uh, trying to get to the end, but I just reviewed the whole thread. So I'm actually going to click on this next thread button, which is going to automatically advance to the next thread in my batch. And again, batching threads together is really important because you've got the consistency, you've got people that uh, are, understand the full context of the conversation, uh, and they're going to move much more quickly because they can tell right off the bat that what they're about to see is going to be responsive. And in this way, they can review the entire thread at once and really expedite that review process. So on this thread, uh, we have a, a new form of indicator present on the messages. And this relates to our communication markers. And our communication markers are what dictate the spine color of the particular nodes or the different messages that we have here. Yellow is going to indicate the presence of a third party based on our function designations. Red is going to indicate the presence of outside or in-house counsel or possibly some other legal agent that you want to be able to incorporate, completely flexible and configurable with this screen. So here, before I even hop into my message, uh, I'm able to see that we've got some attorneys here. We've got a thread that's titled Not Good, which is probably not a very good subject line in this case. Uh, and I can either scroll down to find where the attorney is, or I can very quickly advance the positions in the thread. And this is allowing you to hop right to where certain changes and, and, uh, and participants or otherwise have been identified. And here I can see Addie, our general counsel, has been added to the conversation because they're talking about things moving into a more legal posture with relation to uh, the situation with Susan. Um, and it's important to note that this is a derived message. So this is where we're identifying important people, making it very clear that you've got attorneys or third parties uh, buried in a message 
that may not be at the top level of communicators. And so it's really providing that extra content uh, and extra context uh, and really helping mitigate a lot of the risk related to peer review. So in this case, uh, I'm gonna click over to eight to see what this third party is all about. Looks like we've got Albert Stein and a bunch of other folks have been removed, including Addy. I click on Albert's information. I can see he works, works at WidgetCo, uh, which is considered a third party. And so this could have some implications regarding Priv waiver. So I wanna mark these documents as responsive. I'm gonna mark the whole thread here as responsive. But I'm also going to mark it as potential privilege for tier one attorney-client communication. I'm also gonna mark it as potential privilege uh, or a potential privilege waiver and then click save. And so this will allow me during the first pass review to you know, clearly understand to Joy's point about who the different communicators are. I've got specific rules that can guide me in making some assessments related to potential privilege. And now I can clearly see on the, the messages themselves that we have documents marked as responsive uh, and documents marked as potentially privileged. Uh, it's also important to note that these nodes are derived, so they don't have tags applied to them. Three and four are actually sub-portions of five, and that's why five has the markers here. All right, now I'm gonna advance to the next thread. Okay, so here we've got another message. It looks like we've got some attorneys present. Um, but if we look at the substance of the conversation, it's George looking for help from John Harrison on booking his e-discovery conference trip. I can scroll down and I can see, oop, we've got some PII information here for George. Uh, so that might be important from a different context and helping accelerate that kind of review, maybe a data breach case. Um, but if I scroll down further, it doesn't look like anything here is relevant to what I'm actually looking for. Uh, and here I've actually identified some attachments. And one of the nice things about what we're doing, and you can see this up in the, the map view, is we're identifying the unique instance of an attachment. So we're actually doing a hash comparison on all of the attachments to make sure you're only finding uh, the unique attachments to look at. Um, but in addition, I can preview the attachment by just clicking on this, which is gonna open up uh, a very quick preview of the document HTML form. So I can see, you know, is this document responsive? Is it, does it have some implication on what I'm trying to code for? But here, I've gone through uh, I've reviewed the entire thread, and I've decided that none of this, they're talking about some of the legal ease of the, the promotional material. But I'm going to go ahead and mark this whole thread as being non-responsive. So at this stage, I've reviewed three different threaded conversations as a part of my batch. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to back out. And I'm gonna take a look at how many documents I just reviewed by looking at essentially three threads at once. So if I look at my reviewed documents from a review perspective, I just reviewed 33 documents in only a few minutes. So it's very easy to, to move quickly and again, have full context, full awareness of, of different parties that are members of different communications through the features that we're enabling and really accelerate that first pass review. And now I'm actually gonna show you how this can also play out in the second pass review. So now I'm gonna to go to my second pass privilege review view. And then this is the thread where I identify documents as being potentially privileged. I'm gonna open up this thread here. And now we wanna code documents for privilege and also add a privilege reason. If we look at the threaded conversation, it turns out that uh, in this particular scenario, it looks like we may have an issue with priv waiver on the messages leading up to five because they were forwarded to uh, Albert Stein, who then continued a conversation eight and nine. But six and seven were never a part of this particular thread that was forwarded on. So it's very easy in the application to actually make very targeted decisions. You can use a control key, you can drag and select, but I can go ahead and pick these two messages and it's automatically going to, let me filter these guys. I'm having a little issue with my Chrome here. Um, but it's very issue or easy to take a look at exactly which messages that you've selected, six and seven, and even read them before you make the decision. Uh, and then say, okay, yes, these are the two message I, messages I intend to code. I'm gonna click edit. I'm gonna mark these documents as privileged, returning client communication, 
and this can be whatever privilege field that there are privilege choices that you're using. And maybe I want to take a, a privilege reason and say I want to make this reflecting legal advice of counsel. And then I can click save. So now I've just coded the two documents as being privileged. I've assigned a priv reason to those documents. Uh, and if I come down here, I can very clearly see the different uh, markers that have been identified. And if I click on six and come down to this branch, I can see that the mark is privileged and I can see the privilege reason that's been attached to these. Uh, so it's very easy to see across an entire thread exactly the priv reasons have been assigned, uh, the different, and you can even have directional priv reasons if you wanted to, to get into the, the details of each individual message. It's very easy to review and sort of QC your priv log from this vantage point. Uh, and speaking of privilege logs, um, I'd like to go out and show you um, an example of how these details can work. So our matter analytics output, as well as uh, details that you've coded throughout the process. Uh, but Joy, I, I know you've got a lot of experience helping organizations wrangle with privilege review workflows. Uh, and I'm curious to know, you know how do you see folks uh, utilizing this application and really trying to, to elevate and minimize some of the risk related to privilege review? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I mean, whenever we're doing privilege logs, I think one of the biggest um, issues that we face are the challenges that come with the privilege logs being created, right? For example, people arguing that uh, the, the privilege call may not be um, correct because maybe some of the underlying uh, chains have different people who are not, who are third party or who break privilege. Um, and as you saw, there's some emails where we don't have the underlying children or subchains. So it's, uh, again, great with this kind of main table that you're showing right there that we can display that in our privilege log to show, like, hey, here's the email itself, and then this email actually contains the following names, just to provide, um, again, more transparency into the privilege log and what how we came to those calls. But also, before we even hand it over, it helps our team validate, again, that this is so they can minimize some of the headache that's involved with, yeah, okay, you're right. Those were wrong, and all of a sudden, like if a third of your privilege log <laughs> uh, were, were not correctly um, uh, coded, uh, then you know what does that do for you and, and how you're looked upon from whether it's from the judge or from the opposition. So it puts you on a, a different footing. So just from having that itself um, helps provide again that transparency uh, to the underlying information that you're trying to keep these documents privileged. Um, also, I think when you look at just looking at the uh, formatting, that now we don't have to pop it out and do, you know, you know, flips and turns in Excel to make it look right. You can see just looking at this within um, relativity, it really is, I, I would say, almost right there. I could just go ahead and select, you know, in the mass action, select all and kick it out as Excel. And uh, for some, this is their privilege log. So I think it just makes it faster and also, again, just safer, right? You're, you're, you feel reassured that this is the correct call. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Joy. And, I, and uh, just being sensitive to time, we're going to go ahead, and that's, that's the end of the, the product demonstration. So now I'm going to switch over uh, to questions and answers. And again, apologies for eating up uh, a few minutes of time for folks um, with some of our technical difficulties uh, here in my home office. All right. Um, no, no issues at all. Um, hi, everyone. It's Mike. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, let me start with whether um, – could, could you expand a little bit on uh, whether you have any document, documented metrics on savings uh, with the use of this? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And uh, some of the things that we've been doing recently have been focused on um, doing some internal testing on review speeds. And also we've done a lot of analysis on how much content it's reducing. And so we're seeing uh, from a content perspective, in terms of the information you have to sift through and read and all the cognitive load of piecing the puzzles together, uh, even when you've, you've got inclusive messages to work with, uh, it's about a 70% reduction or up to 70% reduction in that content. And in terms of the speed that it expedites, we're, we're working now to try to work with some organizations that have uh, adopted uh, the matter analytics and incorporating it very heav heavily into their workflow uh, to get some good metrics and to do some case studies on that. But from our own testing, about a three to four X speed increase of review, just given how easy it is to understand, uh, how much it's mitigating risks just due to the, the insights that you're provided. Uh, and it really helps people you know, propel themselves very, very quickly. That's great. Uh, thanks, Jason. And, and earlier on, we had a question. Can I use this with output 
from relativity analytics or other threading solutions? Yes, yeah, good question. So uh, Matter Analytics is using its own proprietary threading algorithm uh, and normalization algorithm, and so there's a lot of smarts that we have uh, underneath the way that we're handling threading and normalization that, that make it possible to do the, the thread viewer and everything else. Uh, so unfortunately, it does not support uh, relativity analytics output or brain space output or, or you know, output from different applications. Uh, it really needs to be run uh, based on our uh, structured analytics capabilities. Okay, great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, here's another one. Uh, what, can you ex expand a little bit on what's the main difference between your threading and name, norm name normalization and what comes out of relativity analytics? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. So we, um, we have uh, spent a lot of time with these algorithms and, and the, the different elements that we're developing uh, in the real world. I think that's really helped us refine a lot in terms of the, the quality of the output, uh, the, the cleanliness of the main normalization output. Um, but in addition to having sort of very high quality results that have been battle tested and, and built you know, in, in the real world, uh, and have seen hundreds and hundreds of millions of documents at this stage, most likely. Um, the other big difference is the things that we're doing to really have more practical ways of presenting the information through the thread viewer, through our people profiles, uh, and really starting to be focused on things, I think, the way that a lot of our customers think, which is a more sort of data-centric, people-centric view of the world, um, especially with regard to per view and obviously a lot of things emerging now in data privacy. So it's a bit of a, a difference in the way that we approach it, but I think it ultimately ends up with uh, being a much more uh, kind of practical workflow and allow folks to, to get adoption and, and do really neat things with it. Sure, and we're, we're coming up on the on uh, the top of the hour here, but one more quick question. What? And I want to remind the audience members if you have a question, just shoot it into the Q and A widget at the bottom of the screen, please. Uh, but here's the next one, Jason. And then I think we'll try to wrap up. Uh, what phase of review are you seeing the thread viewer most used? Um, yeah, it's a good question. And Joy, you may have some some good thoughts here. Uh, I think. Um, you know, from my own vantage point, I think we're seeing it um, uh, used from project managers queuing threads to uh, using it to uh, help accelerate um, really any any phase of the review, uh, data breach incident response reviews. Uh, so it, it it really doesn't have a limit in terms of where it's most valuable. If you use it correctly and get folks trained on it, I think folks can get started really quickly. But Joy, uh, I know you've had some some good luck here, and I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts. Yeah, no, for me, I've been actually doing it right at the beginning when we're getting data and we're trying to just, because, you know, a lot of times when we get data, the attorney's case team will want to take a quick peek, right, run some sort of searches, and they're going to want to try and look what's in there. So we already run them, uh, run this early, early on, like when we're getting data, just so we can understand the kind of content um, that's building. We're starting to build our budgets. When you ask about is there any documentation on what this saves, um, I run it up front so we can talk about, you know, how many documents there are if we're doing a traditional linear review like they want to versus because some case teams are just used to, you know, batch out this custodian and sort it by date and just do a linear review still um, to, hey, you know, if we actually change this up a little bit, we could still batch out your priority custodians in that order. But do you mind if we can start to actually batch it by email threading? And then we show them the number of threads and conversations. And again, you saw that in a matter of a few minutes, um, Jason was able to do three email conversations, which comprised uh, 33 documents that we would have had, that, that would have been, what, a half hour of one reviewer's time, if not more, if they're going 40 to 50 documents per hour. So you can see immediately that kind of cost the value or the potential for savings. So we do that early on because uh, it's usually one or two people who are doing an early case assessment in regards to their case, trying to get a handle of everything. So actually they start to tag things and issue code things early to get a handle of what's going on. So I find that's very useful up front, not just waiting. If you talk about ROI, I, I do it early. Excellent. Thank you, Joy. I know we're, we're now at the end of the hour here. Um, yeah. Any closing thoughts, Jason? Uh, no, I just want to you know thank everybody uh, for their time today. Uh, we hope this presentation provided you with a clear understanding of how solutions like Matter Analytics 
uh, and thoughtful review workflows can really add up to some, some big acceleration uh, and really help you start to, to get better control over a lot of the, the, the risk that is just inherent in email content review. Uh, so again, thank you for your time. Uh, and also, if you happen to be at Relativity Fest next week, please swing by and say uh, hi to us at the exhibit hall. We'll be uh, out there with a, a pod in the exhibit hall. All right, thanks all. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining us on the ACES webinar channel today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Joy. And, of course, our great partner, H5, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, please visit ACEDS.org for a complete list of our upcoming webinars. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.